I'm really delighted to have two fantastic speakers. I'll start with Sam. Sam, please come to the stage. Um, and I just think the, the really looking ahead at the issues that um, both our next speakers have come to address, how you're addressing it, the role that we have in this room and others to support you addressing it, um, I think is really important. It is about saying, how can we help make the future not just a tiny bit better, but an awful lot better. So please, a warm hand of uh, welcome to say thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, so my, my name, name is Shay Akiwowo. I accidentally founded um, my Oops Baby called Glitch uh, two and a half years ago. So um, Glitch is all about ending online abuse and harassment. Can you hear me okay? Glitch is all about ending online abuse and harassment. And this was on the back of being on the receiving end of this. So I was elected in 2014 as the youngest black female councillor in East London. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, because I'm mouthy and because I was seeing quite a lot of injustice take place in my area, I wanted to do something about it. And so um, over the four years, I was doing a lot to try and change representation in politics, trying to inspire the next generation to see politics as an avenue to affect change. And um, that involved being invited to the European Parliament to talk about engaging young people in the European agenda. This was obviously before the EU referendum. Um, I made a speech uh, in response, actually, to something that I was hearing uh, about the Syrian refugee crisis. There was, an, uh, there was an emergency panel that was taking place in response to that um, small boy we saw washed away. Um, and I was hearing a Syrian refugee speak about his experience, sharing that he hasn't been in contact with his family, doesn't know if they're alive. And I'm in the, I'm in the hemicycle of the European Parliament, um, you know, which is a personal kind of achievement for a young black girl from East London to be there. But then also hearing this person who is asking us for solidarity and support. And then all of a sudden, there was waves of booing and heckling, and I could not understand where that was coming from. Kind of long story short, it was the far right, it was the French Nationale who were booing the Syrian refugee on the panel. So being the mouthy person from East End, like I told you I was, or I am, I made a speech. I didn't know what I was going to say, but it was in solidarity with what, the, what, was, what was happening to um, the refugee on the panel. And the video of that speech was posted online. It went viral. Um, it was great because I thought, this is, the, this is it. Ellen is going to invite me onto her show. <laughs> I am going to get a free car. Idris Elba's finally going to notice me. And, you know, this is it. I've made it. I'm going to get all the free, like, tummy tees and wigs for the rest of my life. Um, none of that happened. I'm still waiting for Idris Elba to notice me. Um, yes, ah, oh, indeed. The day that he got married was a very sad day. Um, but what did happen was one day I was at the gym getting summer body ready, and uh, I was on the treadmill, and my Spotify kept dipping out, and I could not understand why. So I stopped the treadmill, and I picked up my phone, and in my phone was full of abuse. It was full of notifications, floods and floods of racist abuse, sexist death threats, you, you name it. And it was because it turned out through police investigation and them coming to my house and making various statements that that video was posted on a neo-Nazi website. So I was on the, I was on the targeting, I was targeted by, uh, by people. Don't know who they are, we still don't know who they are. But this was less than a year after Joe Cox had been murdered. My address as a counsellor was public at the time, so there was a huge concern for my safety. And it was at that moment I knew I had two decisions, right? You, you tend to have, when you're in that kind of situation, you have two kind of scenarios that go, to, go through your head, fight or flight. And I told you, mouthy girl from East End, I'm not going to be pushed away from the online space. 
And I was increasingly frustrated with how social media companies were responding to online abuse. They were saying it wasn't a violation of their terms, they weren't taking down content. It was like they wanted there to be this level of toxicity happening on the platforms to drive profit. And that felt frustrating as a user, as somebody who had used social media as a way of getting elected as a way of being held, in, held accountable, as a way of trying to increase diversity representation. To, it felt disrespectful, at, at the very least, um, that these social media companies were not responding. But what was increasingly frustrating was the response from other people. Well-intentioned people, including my Nigerian mother, who was like, oh my god, what have you done? Um, but victim blaming. Well, maybe you shouldn't have said that, or well, maybe you should just come off Twitter. Oh, you know, you know what, maybe your account could go private. And that was that increasing censorship response that was also frustrating. And I would just said to people, you wouldn't say that to a woman offline. You wouldn't say to a woman, don't walk down Oxford Circus, don't go down to Brixton, don't go to Westfield, don't go to Topshop, because there's somebody that might harass them. Why have we made this the automatic response to somebody who is going through abuse online? And so that was what was the driving, driving point in the campaign two and a half years ago that opened many doors to talk about this because I knew I wasn't the only one, right? I knew I, there were many women in, in, in my party, in politics, in, in life, journalists, any woman who dares to kind of um, be, 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 be confident in themselves were under an attack. And it's not just women, but women are disproportionately affected. I said, let's do something about it. And so Glitch is about understanding how we can start addressing these glitches in the online space. And the biggest thing that we push is around digital citizenship. Digital citizenship is about us having digital rights and responsibilities. So we have a right to vote. We have a right to education. But it also requires responsibility. Some people are not responsible, but obviously, as you can see with the current political climate. But and nevertheless, we do agree that there is a level of responsibility when it comes to voting. And so how do we start discussing what our digital citizenship kind of expectations and, and leadership requirements are from us as individuals? around cyber security, around our digital footprint, around our data and privacy. But how do we ask that of each other? How do we become online active bystanders so that if you see someone being abused online, you see someone facing bullying, what can we do as civic uh, leaders? Like, what can we do as uh, social leaders for each other? But what, more importantly, and what I'm going to focus on with the rest of the conversation, um, is around what is institutions can do what obviously tech can do and what governments can do. And we do a lot of advocacy work with the UN, with Twitter, with Facebook, and, and we are pushing, we're definitely pushing. But there's also a real opportunity for brands as well. Brands as employers and brands as huge online influences. I love that Nike was used as an example in the earlier session. And shout out to Sue, because I think you are amazing if you're still in the room. Um, Nike, I use as an example of a really good brand that was trying to champion social injustice and did take a side. And they do that very well even with Serena, William, uh, Serena Williams. But when Serena Williams is called the N-word or, or there's photos of her put next to gorillas and monkeys, Nike is silent. How can Nike as a brand start insinuating or demonstrating digital citizenship on its platform? This doesn't mean that Nike needs to, be, uh, needs to be dragged into every single discussion and debate because, as was mentioned by the McDonald's guy, that's, you, you've got things to do and that can be quite tiring. Totally understand. But, but there is things around reporting some of the abuse that you see taking place, if, particularly if your account has been tagged into it. Opening a dialogue and having a conversation with Twitter, as brands, you can say, look, if we keep being dragged into abuse and we do not see Twitter or Facebook or YouTube take these contexts down, there will be repercussions around how we advertise and how we, how we generate revenue for, for these platforms. But brands definitely can start having a conversation about their digital citizenship responsibilities, also to their employers. So do you have policies in place around um, safeguarding of your staff, particularly those that may be doing public speaking engagements, those that may have to have an online profile? Because as mentioned earlier, lots of things are moving on to the online space. 
Do brands provide support for any of their employees who may be facing online abuse? We increasingly see videos now being filmed of incidents happening at restaurants or in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a retail store, etc., etc. What policies do you have in place for obviously responding to that, if particularly have, if there's something that did need to be called out, but also for somebody who has now become public who wasn't expecting to, and that was because they were an employee um, under your duty of care. These are, this, this is not to now at all kind of um, beat, you with a, um, I don't know what to, beat you with a stick. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to give you scenarios and questions to start thinking about what more can you do, what more can we do to start reclaiming our online spaces? And what can we do to help those that are disproportionately affected? Because we've spoken a lot about marginalized communities and underrepresented communities. And, that, and if we understand that to be true offline, it's the same online. So women globally are 27 times more likely to be harassed online than men. That's a UN statistic from a few years ago. So I'm sure it's a whole lot worse now. Black women are 84% more likely to be mentioned in problematic or abusive tweets. That's 84% more likely than a white woman. And then young girls are starting to close down their social media accounts. You've got 47, 43% of girls now saying that they don't really engage the online space the way that they wanted to. First of all, that's not great for you guys who want to use the online space to market to the next generation. But that's not great for our democracy. That's not great for society if we're seeing the next generation already censoring themselves. So I would really, really encourage brands in the room, companies and those with influence to really think about what could we do to start enacting this idea that we have digital responsibility. We don't have to wait for things to be illegal. We don't have to wait for things to be, become a death threat or a rape threat before we enact. How can we start rewarding positive behavior, you know, liking positive comments, liking positive behavior and rewarding that? And how can we as brands, well, I'm not a brand, how can you guys, how can you guys start holding social media companies to account and saying, look, I'm sick of my handles, I'm sick of my brand being associated with so much toxicity and Twitter and Facebook and all the other companies are not doing anything about it. Thank you. Shay and I first met each other at the OECD in Paris, um, where again you were on a very interesting panel talking about this. And, and one of the things that you were also able to share was the work that you've been doing with Google. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Well, I think it was Google because I couldn't reveal that it, who it really was. Um, so Google um, uh, asked us to, because I signed an NDA. Um, so Google, <laughs> so B Google asked us to. Um, asked me to come in a few years ago to do, so help do some machine learning. And uh, at the time, it's so exciting. I was thinking, oh my gosh, Google is asked, calling me to want to help. And then you pick at it and you realize, as the conversation in the last session um, touched upon, about it being really shallow and it not really going to the, um, the crux of it. And it was, a, it was one conversation I remember having with like a big, per like a big, uh, important person in Google and um, who's basically going to sign off on this. And um, they were recapping kind of what the expectations were of me and it was to, um, to, to flag any sexist remarks, any sexist comments that I received on social media or that I saw when I was reading the papers and I was like, you really do not know me if you think I read the papers online. <laughs> but fine. Um, and I said, you do realize, though, that I won't just be picking up sexist comments. They were like, he was like, what do you mean? I was like, you do realize that it won't just be misogynistic comments that I would be flagging. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm black, so I'm going to be pointing out racist comments too. Racialized sexism, misogynoir. He could not get it. So I literally got a mark board and a, white, a, mark, a mark, marker pen on the whiteboard and I tried to explain intersectionality to Google. This is 20, this was 2018, and that was shocking that that had not been understood by such a big platform around how users experience the online space, 
how users are treated as well. Um, and I can say now that that, that work didn't go ahead, <laughs> but yes. Um, other work that we do is around advocacy with business and tech. So with, sorry, business and tech and government. With government, there was the online harms white paper that was um, uh, out over just before the summer. And it was a, consult it was a white paper consultation um, asking for as many people to contribute to ideas around a regulator and what would that look like around kind of class disputes, so big like class um, actions around um, violations on platforms, um, looking at AI as a potential solution, looking at extremism, children, not so much charge exploitation in this, um, in this paper. Um, and it was also looking at a media literacy strategy. And so we were doing a lot of work around this, this idea of digital citizenship being a part of media literacy. So yes, understanding how to code is really important and understanding you know, the right blue to use and stuff, right? And the code, HTML code for that, super important. But what about this idea of creating systems, tech and platforms that already have digital citizenship embedded in it? That way we don't have to start, we don't have to play a chasing game of trying to fix something that actually is inherently dodgy, right? Quite a lot of these platforms, their product designs is built towards negative behavior. It's built towards us commenting and actually it's the negative comments that tend to do well. That's why actually if we, if we highlight the more positive comments, we can combat, combat that. Um, and then with business and, and, and tech, it's definitely around their policies. At the moment, no platform has a policy on online gender-based violence. So it doesn't look at, at, the ha at hate speech women, 51% of the population, receive. And so that is a real problem um, at the moment because it just means they keep tripping up. And then we also do workshops. So we deliver training. Um, around digital self-care and self-defense to any woman in public life. So any woman who's a journalist, uh, a public figure of their company, obviously in politics, um, or thinking about kind of being an activist or a campaigner, we provide training and workshops either for the organization or the individual themselves around this idea about self-care and thinking about setting boundaries and also your kind of digital, digital security. So things from passwords all the way up to kind of cleaning your social media history. And then we go into schools and deliver uh, digital citizenship education. And it's, it's fascinating. I love, I'm a, my background's in facilitation. Um, and so I love to hold on to that, that, that bit of, um, of, of Glitch, Glitch's work. And it's fascinating because it keeps me aware of the different issues young people are facing. Like online bullying is through the roof. And um, suicide is seen as like, a, as, as a possible kind of get out of this horrible situation that I am. Like, it's very much an option to young people, and it's so terrifying. And it's so terrifying that young people don't see the risks around being online as well, so very much share and overshare, and they don't think about their digital footprint. We've had cases of um, young people who um, have had kind of third-party, non-consensual photography on their phone. The young people in the video were under 18. It was now classified as child pornography. And that person who had it on their phone faced three months in jail, even though it wasn't, they, they, wasn't, they wasn't the author of the video. And so those complexities are very real in, in, um, in schools. And we've delivered training to 3,500 young people across the UK and also digital resilience training in Ghana and in, Go in Jordan, because believe it or not, the internet does not respect our binary borders. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I think there, there's information for you about Glitch and what Glitch does, and I think it's an important element to add to our conversations about where, where these things are going and how we can actually make a better world together. And I believe our speaker is here. Yes, Ella. Ella will talk to us a little bit about your wonderful young world. And then we'll go to combined Q&A for both our very energetic and dynamite speakers at the end of our afternoon. So over to you, Phil Nella. Great. Um, so just as a quick introduction, um, I am the managing director of One Young World, which CNN handily called us the junior Davos, which is a very nice, quite shorthand. Uh, but we are not about talking. We are about action. Uh, we will be coming to London for our 10th anniversary this year, uh, which will be the most international gathering in the UK other than the 2012 Olympics. 
and it's just before Halloween potential Brexit deadline, so it couldn't be a more exciting time to be bringing the world to London. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'm going to introduce what I've got to say with a quick film about what I do, um, and then I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about how we do it. So if we could cue the film, thank you. So that was our summit last year in The Hague, which is the city of peace and justice. So it was an amazing, amazing opportunity to work with institutions like the ICC and the ICJ. And we're bringing it home to London in six weeks' time. So uh, my team is a little bit stressed right now, but very, very excited. Um, so at One Young World, um, we fundamentally believe that business is not only part of the solution, but in many respects is the solution for lots of the global challenges we face. And many of you will be my clients. Hello, thank you. Those of you who aren't yet my clients, please come and see me afterwards. Um, and people partner with us by sending their young leaders to One Young World to take part in our program, to take part in our summit, and then to be part of our ambassador community, which is about 11,000 people in 196 countries. Um, it's very nice to come to an exciting conference, to come to a special day like today, and hear lots of exciting ideas and feel inspired, but it's all, there's not really much point in it if we don't go home and do something because of it. So we partner with PwC to measure our impact, um, and we are really excited that our impact in our community is 13 to 1, uh, our social return on investment. So for every $1 put into these projects, they're generating on average $13 worth of social impact around the world. So we know that young leaders are very effective actors of change. And that's why lots of companies want to work with us, because they too know that their employees are the heart of them being a successful business in the future, being a more ethical business in the future. They're their future consumers, their future stakeholders, and they've got the ideas about how these companies can change. One of the things that we do find is that some people go, God, I brought you 20 brilliant young employees. They're my future CEO, my future CFO to One Young World. And now they all want to go and start their own business or start their own uh, NGO. What, how, what, what can I do? So we work with them to keep their employees and to channel that energy, to channel that passion into their companies and identify solutions to global challenges. You do not have to quit your job to change the world. You can do it from within a company, and sometimes from within a big company, you can have even more uh, impact and even more, um, an even greater solution than you would on your own. So an example um, of uh, a brilliant One Year World ambassador who's done some fantastic things is a guy called Luke Davies, who's at Barclays. Um, who was sent by Barclays to One Young World in Bangkok with a group of Barclays delegates um, and was listening to all these amazing speakers from around the world, young people from developing countries, from you couldn't imagine more different backgrounds. Um, and Luke was particularly inspired by a guy from the Marshall Islands who was saying, you know, my neighbors have already had to move house owing to sea level rise. This is not a phantom problem that's a next year, next decade problem. This is affecting us in our jobs today. We don't want to move. I don't want to leave the Marshall Islands. I love my home. I love my culture. But if, we, if, if sea level rise continues, our islands will be lost, and we will be knocking on your door. If we don't save the islands, the world may not survive. And Luke was going, oh my god, sea level rise, refugees, Syria. I never thought about the climate refugees. I mean, I think that's something now, four years later, we're probably a bit more familiar with. But at the time, it was news to him. And so he went back, and he was like, gee, I've, I've got to do something about the climate refugees, the climate refugees. But I like my job at Barclays. You know, I, I really do like my Barclays salary. Um, I like working at my bank. I like my colleagues. What can I do? And Luke has um, created the most fantastic green deposit scheme within Barclays, which he feels is, um, you know, he feels that financial institutions are absolutely key to decarbonizing our economy. And lots of the businesses here today will have done similar things internally. And it's about how we can use our big businesses to help create these systemic changes that we know that we need to see if we are to have a decarbonized economy, if we are to end modern day slavery, if we are to include, if we are to have a more gender inclusive and gender equal society. And I think lots of us know that we don't want the companies we work for to be the bad guys. We want to feel like we go home at the end of the day, yes, ka capitalism, we've got our salary, but we want to know that we made a difference. And that's a big problem for um, employers and for HR directors and recruiters, especially millennials, especially Gen Z, having lived through, in my opinion, having lived through the financial crisis and not felt that any career is necessarily for life or no career is a guarantee of financial security, if you're not going to be financially secure, you may as well be doing a good thing in the world, right? 
So we have to make our companies more purpose-driven, not just because we want to solve these problems, but because the next generation of talent that we want to employ will only engage with us if we're very serious about taking them on. So I've just um, co-authored a book called How to Make a Difference, uh, which is about effective activism. Because I think a lot of us think, I've done the right thing. You know, I, I recycle. Great. That doesn't make you an activist, guys. No, no, no. Um, maybe when you start to convince 10 other people, 20 other pe people to recycle, you can start thinking of yourself as an activist. But I think a lot of what we've been telling ourselves about sustainable business is that, well, the consumers will eventually want to make good personal choices, and at that point, then the business will meet the consumers. But we have to be meeting each other in a more ambitious place if we're going to address the sustainable development goals for starters. Um, and so in, the, in, in How to Make a Difference, we interviewed 100 of the world's most uh, leading activists from everything from anti-FGM through to modern-day slavery through to elephants. And you know, we asked them, well, what makes your activism effective? Because a lot of people think that they're making a difference and they don't really realize how far off they are. And a lot of people think they're making a tiny difference and are actually making a bigger impact than they would ever have imagined. So some of the people we interviewed were um, one, of, one of the guys, Dr. Larry Brilliant, great name, uh, is one of the people who was on the t led the team to eradicate smallpox. I mean, what a you know, world-changing contribution to our planet. So I'm sitting there sort of on Skype, pretend, trying to pretend I'm not in my pajamas, being like, oh my God, what am I going to say to this, this eminent doctor? Um, and one of the things that I think was so clear from the book is that even these most ambitious goals of ending smallpox, ending modern-day slavery, you know, bringing down apartheid, whatever it might be, it started with how we all feel right now of... I'm just one person. How am I going to change Twitter? How am I going to make the internet safe for my kids? How am I going to um, end plastic use in a company that essentially relies on people using lots and lots of plastic every day? These questions, we go, how will I do that? Every single activist that we've ever admired and ever looked up to has had that same question. And if we keep on asking ourselves that and turning to our colleague and turning to our friends and say, how can we do this? What five people can you bring with you? What 50 people can you, bring, can you bring with you? You can change your company. But it's not enough to be one tiger team in an organization or one rabble rouser. To make systemic change, we have to bring a whole company with us. So, and that's important. You know, sometimes change will not be as quick as we hope for it to be. But not to get frustrated about that. That kind of, you know, I think a lot of people say, oh, we've got energized young employees and then visionary leadership and then the stodgy middle management. Well, I'm sure lots of you are middle management. I'm technically middle management in my organization. Yay, us, we're great. But yeah, we've got a lot of priorities to balance. But I really believe that through One Young World, we've seen that energizing your young workforce can help bring middle management with you, can help make sure that we are making these changes in a sustainable way. Because it's no point putting a policy in place that next year when the share price isn't looking so great, we've got to scrap. These have got to be changes for the long term. And I really believe that with One Young World and with brilliant young leaders uh, you know, that we, we're inspired by every day, that these changes are possible, that they are real, and that if we work together, business is going to be come out of this looking a lot rosier. Yes, we're all here to reimagine capitalism. It can serve us better. But it's, we, are, we are having those conversations that 20 years ago no one thought we needed to have. They assumed that we'd end up in a good place. And actually, lots of people are really questioning the system that we live in. But I know that today we've heard some fantastic answers to these big questions. Um, I hope that some of you will take away One Young World as potentially a, you know, a kind of a tool in your toolkit that you can use to help make change in your own companies. Um, it's such a pleasure to be with you here today and uh, hear all these exciting ideas. So thank you very much for having me. through the activist and an activist on stage. So well done. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Ella. Um, we have time for a few questions. Um, I'm delighted to open to the audience. Any questions? Yeah, right at the, the back of the room. Ooh, thanks. Um, yeah, Ben Atkins from, uh, I live in California, work for healthcare. Um, you mentioned in your talk the social media platforms, and coming back to the theme today, populism versus capitalism, it feels like the social media platforms are where these two, there's a big collision with the whole populism thing, and I think we agree, or it sounds like we agree, that they're perhaps not doing enough to push back on some of the hate speech and what have you. Now, as a call to action, we have in the room, obviously, somebody who represents one of the biggest meetings in south of France, where these platforms are given a huge opportunity to push their platforms for massive amounts of advertising. 
And it feels, because I'm running a campaign in the US looking at trying to help these platforms be healthier for people vulnerable to mental health. And it's, you can't even get a meeting with them unless you're willing to spend huge amounts of money. So should there be an effort at the next CAN meeting to say, look guys, if you want to have access to all of this money, it's now time for you actually to start really making a difference. And if they're not willing to, start to pull some of that money away or as companies and work together as an alliance to say, we'll come back when you start to really demonstrate a commitment to making these platforms safer. Thank you, Ben. It sounds like a question for Phil. I don't know, Ella or Shay, if you have a view on that. Um, so I, I agree that definitely you all in the room and your companies can help put pressure on platforms. Um, there was a campaign on uh, Facebook a few years ago led by Laura Bates who founded every, hashtag Everyday Sexism. And essentially her and somebody called Soraya um, Shemeli was able to, able to find a list of the big kind of um, ad users on Facebook and, uh, and start targeting them. Why? Because it turns out there was a few Facebook groups that were allowed to exist that were taking photos of women on tubes who were eating um, and would put menacing, disgusting, harassing comments on it in the group and like really rile them, rile them up. And each time women would report it, Facebook would say, this is not a violation of their policy, this comes under free speech. And so to get them to take action, they found this, they, they created this list, target list of the top 10 or top 20 ad users on, on, on Facebook and, and sent a, did a screenshot with the ad, uh, did a screenshot of what was in these groups um, plus the company's ad and sent it to them and said, do you want to be associated with this? Do you want to know, do you want to know that your income is helping fund this? And actually, that was a very simple but effective way of getting those groups sent down. Now, that um, closed down. Now, that was only dealing with what is obviously the fruit of a wider systematic issue. And I think, uh, I think hosting a conversation or allowing more business to be involved in policy design of these companies and product design of these companies would be a lot more effective long-term solution. But that doesn't mean because I'm all with you on bashing social media companies and I do it, like I literally did it this morning to Twitter. Uh, I'm with you on that. But there is a, a, an opportunity for all of us to play our part. The next time you see someone being abused online, do, can you report it to the platform? Can you, report, can you help report it to the police? Can you send them a direct message and just check that they're okay? Because we are seeing a rise in um, suicide and self-harming. We've seen um, Jessie from Little Mix share her story about the impact online bullying was having and how it was important for the other Little Mixers um, to support her in that. Can we as individuals do that? But then also an example I'd love to uh, quickly share is Lidl. Over the weekend, Lidl was, uh, had a campaign that basically had a um, Muslim Asian family uh, like, like advertising their products and a very well-known uh, white supremacist woman was basically like shame on Lidl blah 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 and that Lidl did a, a very very good effective statement saying we've reported this racist and Islamophobic tweet to Twitter and we expect it to be taken down and we are also looking at other ways to, to, to address this. This was a really good stance from Lidl, who I'm now considering to shop at because of this, right? Um, a really good stance from Lidl to say, look, this, you will not, you will not spread hate speech in our name. And I think, I mean, personally, I think on social media, in the same way that your brands, if there was a TV show like the Jeremy Kyle show or something, you might not choose to have your brand advertise in the ad break of something like the Jeremy Kyle show. Maybe you are, maybe that's, maybe that's your call as a brand. But we, advertisers have absolutely got to be using their heads. If, if platforms are going wrong, you should not be spending your ad dollars there. There's a risk it could backfire on you and you shouldn't be funding you know, essentially misogynist or, or racist platforms. Um, we, we can use our ad dollars better. And we can, and, and you know, if, if advertisers are holding Twitter, Facebook, Instagram to account, they will respond to that. They are deeply, deeply cynical capitalist companies. Um, sorry, whoever's, you know, good for you. But I mean, you know, advertisers have got a major role to play and whether that's at Cannes or whether that's at somewhere else, I think that's absolutely the discussion to be having. Thank you both. Another question? We've got here and then in the back. <clears throat> My name's Jessica. I'm 
James Allison, Stuart Allen. Thank you both for being here and uh, sharing your uh, experiences. Uh, and one of the things that strikes me is maybe there's an opportunity for ECHO research or, or somebody to track the disconnect between the stated purpose of companies, because we've been talking about that all afternoon, mm -hmm. and where they show up on social media, which is clearly at odds with their explicit purpose. So where there's a disconnect, uh, wouldn't it be wise to somehow expose it and highlight it? The company would be uh, no doubt very concerned because this undermines the brand and the reputation. Uh, and if, if a brand is trying to get traction, it's trying to recruit you as a shopper, for example, then doing something that's in sync with its stated purpose should be uh, what they ought to be doing online and offline. So just, a, I don't know, maybe it's a business development idea, I don't know. <laughs> Good business development. No, and it's absolutely right. I think the, the, the concept of disconnect is exactly where those conversations talk about. I mean, companies will say gap analysis, and I'm saying disconnect. Oh. You know, it, it, this, this stuff hurts. Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. It was a question at the back, I believe. Um, Ella, I think it's probably more one for you, but do you encourage your members your young members to take a stance, for example, on the boards of their organizations. Is it something that you think they need to try and make an effort to do? We heard earlier about you know, some more innovative companies putting young people on their boards to try and get more equity of view. And I just wonder what your view was on that. Um, I think it's an excellent Thank question, you. and I, I really support boards that do you try and create legit spots for young people. I'm less of a fan of youth boards and shadowing boards and things like that. I think that's a really good way to pat people on the head, uh, listen very nicely and say, now trot along. Um, one of the, actually, on a, on, a, on a similar point with protests, one of the activists we interviewed for the book was Kumi Naidu. Um, and he said, you know, with protests, when you go out on the streets and you march, a lot of the time people say, oh, our protest worked. The president met with us and listened to our demands. <laughs> the president didn't necessarily do anything. He just took the photo opportunity and trotted on. And I think sometimes youth engagement in companies can work like that. But I absolutely think that successful companies are very, success are very serious about engaging with their next generation of employers, customers, stakeholders, suppliers, um, in a way that hits your genuine you know, infrastructure of your company and doesn't leave it to be an afterthought. Um, we certainly see with One Young World that people who embed their, their One Young World program get more out of it than people who kind of just use it as like a, an incentive for you know, their top 40 millennial workers or whatever it might be. So the more seriously we can take these in issues, the better, because millennial employees aren't young employees anymore. You know, they are, they are, they are your, your middle management, potentially senior management. Uh, you've got Gen Z coming into the workplace. Some of them weren't even alive when 9-11 happened. And Gen Alpha's got its own identity. So we have to be awake to the fact that there are these different demographics now, so we don't, we're not trying to play catch up in 10 years time. May I just add to that as somebody whose background is in diversity and inclusion, and, that, and I completely agree with Ella that it has to be meaningful. I've been on the receiving end of being a part of a tokenistic youth board and representing the youth council, and it can be so frustrating, actually can do a lot of damage. But for meaningful diversity and inclusion really means changing everything that you do. So the way you are hiring, the expectations you have of them. Like I, I am somebody that lives and breathes diversity and inclusion. And when I, was help, when I was recruiting for our trustee board, we really struggled because if we're looking from the pool of the charity sector, the charity sector in itself is not diverse. So if I'm trying to get a black woman to be our, our finance trustee or to get any you know, further representation and diversity, it's really hard. And so the way we even do our advertising, recruitment, talk about the board has to be really inclusive. And even think, it, and your expectation of a youth trustee shouldn't be patronizing, but should also give a grace period for that, that element of growth and investing in their capacity building so they can catch up with the other trustees. So there are meaningful, and also understanding that where they would give an ad, an ad value will be completely different to somebody who's an accountant or a legal trustee. On that, I do, I do hope we'll carry on the conversation. We started off about the present is tense, and I think it definitely is tense. Uh, we do face crises in many different directions, but I also think there's cause for optimism and for pragmatism. We saw the capitalist model really does need change, and the business really has to be part of the solution and it is part of the solution. Boards, as we just touched on, I think need to be fit for purpose. 
both in terms of their remit, but also in terms of their composition and their strategy and direction. Entrepreneurs have much to do. Businesses have much to do. But so do policymakers and regulators. They have a role to enable and facilitate this whole process too. The future is already here, and change starts today. Please join us for a drink next door. Thank you all. <laughs>